All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Orchid Festival 2021 Wild Discoveries. Um, many thanks to the friends of the Bruce District Parks Association who, with the assistance of Parks Canada, have facilitated this event so we can immerse ourselves in the beauty of the Bruce Peninsula and learn more about our roles in preserving that beauty. We're here today on the traditional territory of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation comprised of two communities, Saugeen First Nation and the Chippewas of Nawash, who have been stewards of this land since time immemorial. I encourage each and every one of you to educate yourselves further about the land that you live on, and I suggest consulting nativeland.ca to learn more about the Indigenous territories, Indigenous languages, and treaties of the place you call home. Over the next three evenings, we have six exciting presentations, beginning this evening with Brian Popelier's presentation on identifying orchid species on the Saugeen, Bruce Peninsula, and Tyler Miller's presentation, Time Travel on an Alvar, A Plant's Perspective. If you have questions for the presenters during the presentation, I encourage you to ask them using the Q&A function that can be accessed at the bottom of this screen. Zach, one of our volunteers, will highlight questions to be answered live at the end of the presentation and will facilitate the live Q&A session. At the end of Brian's presentation and the question session, we'll break for five minutes between presentations to allow Tyler to set up and for all of you to stretch and grab food and run to the washroom if you need to. I think we're ready to begin. Our first presenter today is Brian Popelier. Brian works with the Bruce Trail Conservancy as the Land Stewardship Coordinator and Ecologist. He holds a BSc in Environmental Science and Biology from Trent University, as well as certificates in Ecological Land Classification, Bird and Plant Identification, Butternut Assessment, Ontario Pesticide Forestry License, and Ontario Wetland Evaluation. He can often be found in the forests and watersheds of Ontario hiking, fishing, photographing, camping, or simply enjoying nature's beauty. Welcome, Brian. Thanks, Alex. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm just gonna share my screen here quickly. All right. All right, so like, like I said, good evening, everyone. So we're going to talk about um, some orchids on the Saugeen Peninsula um, along the Bruce Trail. So this is just a slide showing the Bruce Trail Conservancy, our, our mission, our vision, and our values. Um, for those of you who, who might not know, the Bruce Trail Conservancy is one of the largest land trusts in Ontario. Uh, we manage over 14,000 acres of, of land all the way from Niagara Falls to, all the way to Tobermory. And um, we allow ecolog ecological sustainable access to that land through the Bruce Trail. So orchids on the peninsula. So there's many, many species of orchids that call the Saugeen Peninsula home. And it's always a treat to come across them in the wild. But one of the best ways to see these beautiful plants is to take a wander along the Bruce Trail. And, um, Tonight we're going to focus on some of the more common species that you may discover when you go for a hike along the trail. So when we're talking about orchids and um, looking for them and, and enjoying them, we have a big caveat, look but don't touch. Um, please do not leave the trail to take any photos. Um, many of the, our orchids are in wetlands and fragile environments. So we want to make sure that you stay at least one to two meters away from the orchids um, as they're susceptible to soil compaction and, and disturbance. So you want to leave the orchids as you found them. Um, orchids are very environment specific, so please do not help, help them by weeding around them in any way. Orchids grow where they do because the vegetation and the ground features around them is very specific to each species. Never, 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 pick an orchid's flowers or try to dig up the plant because obviously that's going to kill and destroy the plant. Um, this is how populations are eradicated of, of orchids for you know, future generations and, and possibly this generation. There's quite a few orchids out there that are, are very rare. So you know, we, we don't want to disturb them whatsoever. Just want to leave them where they are. And also if you dig up an orchid because it's so environment specific, and you try to plant it in your garden, it's not going to grow. It just, it needs, needs to be where, where it is to, to be successful. <clears throat> Another thing to think of is please 
never share the organ's locations to the public. Um, there's a lot of apps now, such as iNaturalist, that allow you to take a picture of, of a species and then you post it on, on the internet. Um, and that, that allows anyone to see where that, that species is located. But there is a feature on these apps that you can actually obscure the location. So, um, you know, you can post that you saw an orchid in, in Bruce County, but it doesn't show exactly where the, the species was located. Um, because unfortunately, there, there's a lot of people that actually use these apps to look for rare species and, and orchids in particular are very popular because people want to dig them up. So um, just be very careful when, when posting on public sites. And when taking photos of orchids, please be aware of the plants around, like around that orchid and where your feet are. Um, you always have to watch where you're stepping. Because when where there's one orchid, guaranteed there's probably going to be um, a lot more. So for this reason, you know, small group sizes are recommended for orchid hikes or, or one or two people. Um, I've actually found myself, I, I'm a bit of an amateur photographer. A lot of the pictures in this presentation are, are, are my pictures but I have a big zoom lens, but I've actually found myself sometimes, you know, leaning down to get a, a good shot and you look down and some orchid species are very small. Some are only like a couple inches high. Um, and so the one time I, I was looking down and there's a little heart shaped toy blade, which is only about that big. And, and it, you could hardly see it if you weren't really looking for it. So you, you really gotta be careful. So let's get into some orchid species. So our first species is the Alaska orchis. Um, so it's, it's a very tall, slender plant, um, very delicate looking. The, the flowers, once again, are very delicate. They grow in a, a small spike and they're, they're green in, in color. Um, it grows in the like, thin soil of, of open forest of aspen or birch, sometimes grassy borders of thickets. But most of the time along the Bruce Trail, you can find it in the balsam cedar forest along the, um, the escarpment rim. So up top of the escarpment, you see a lot of the uh, Alaska orchids um, growing there. And so for each species too, I also put in a little fun fact. So the fun fact for the Alaska orchis is it's pollinated by moths. So the blunt leaf rain orchid, this is another beautiful, beautiful species. Um, it's not very showy, but in my, in my mind, it's, um, it's just a beautiful species when you come across it. Because it's, it's, it's not rare by any means, but where it grows, it likes to grow in coniferous bogs and swamps. So um, a lot of times it's, it's hard, hard to find unless you're tromping around in these, these uh, swamps and bogs, which we don't recommend. Um, like I said, if, if the trail goes through these wetlands, you want to make sure you stay on the trail and just view the, view the habitat directly from the trail. So this species normally has basically one um, pretty broad leaf, but it's broadest above the middle. And then it has a nice blunt or rounded tip. And it uh, tapers at the base where it attaches to the, to the plant. Um, so you can usually find this, this plant blooming from June to August. Um, so if uh, you know you want to aim to find a specific species, you, you kind of look to when it when it, its blooming period is and then you can you can maybe find them when they're in flower. So the fun fact for this one is it actually has the distinction of being the only North American plant that is confirmed to be pollinated by mosquitoes. So I'm sure there's lots of other plants that are pollinated by mosquitoes, but this one they've actually confirmed that um, you know, mosquitoes do some pollination. So there, there's, there's a good reason to like mosquitoes now. They pollinate the blunt leaf rain orchid. So the, the, the next species is the broad-lipped twig blade. Uh, usually has two opposite ellipt elliptical leaves. Most twig blades have those two um, um, kind of opposite elliptical leaves. And this one's no different. Uh, so it blooms between June to July. So it's a, it's a, it's a short bloomer. It doesn't, doesn't have a, a long blooming time. Once again, it likes um, wetlands and coniferous swamps, sometimes on stream borders in coniferous forests and the, the seeps. If you go along the bottom, if the trail ever goes along the bottom of the escarpment, 
we get a lot of seeps where the um, surface water kind of flows under the, the rock and comes out on the bottom of the escarpment in these nice lush um, wet areas. So you, you get a lot of different types of uh, plants in those areas. So after the seeds disperse, they grow underground for two to three years before producing leaves. So that's uh, kind of an interesting fact. So our next species is uh, probably one of my favorites, it, just because it's so showy and, and, and just a gorgeous, gorgeous orchid when you see them. Sometimes I find some of our orchid species are very nondescript and they're very hard to see. So you really got to look. A lot of them are, have green flowers. So it, uh, when the background's all green, it's sometimes it's really hard to, to spot some of these orchids. But this orchid, you can, you can see it from quite a ways away because as you can see, it's, uh, it's quite showy. So it has a single leaf and it's a very long linear and grass-like. Uh, so it's called tuberous grass pink which makes sense because of uh, the kind of linear grass-like leaves. So uh, the flowers, as you can see, they're just very large and pink, um, very showy. And interesting enough, when you look at them close, it almost appears that the flowers are like upside down than, than a regular um, orchid species would be. So this, uh, this species you can, you can find from June to August. Um, actually, Right now, it's, uh, you know, we're in July. If you take a drive on the, the west side of the peninsula, uh, where Oliphant is in, in that area, you can find these orchids. They're so common there. They're like dandelions. They're, they're growing everywhere. You can just you take a walk along the roadside, and you can see hundreds of these, these, um, <laughs> these orchids growing there. So um, they're, they're not real common along the Bruce Trail, unless once, you, once again, you walk through um, an area that uh, has some bogs or, or fens in it or a wet meadow. And uh, the fun fact is these showy, nice pink flowers, sometimes they're actually pure white. So it's uh, interesting to see. I've only seen that once in my, uh, my experiences as a, just a pure white tuberous grass pink flower. But. So now we're gonna get into the coral roots. So this species along the Bruce Trail is, is a lot of them are fairly common. They're the three species that I'm going to highlight uh, tonight are, um, are the most common ones. Once again, there's, there's a lot more orchids that you can see, but they're not that common and some are rare. So um, the ones I picked are kind of ones that you're most likely to see when, you, you know, even if you just go for an hour hike along the trail. So this one is early coral root. And really, they, they don't have a, a lot of leaves like, like we think of a leaf. Um, they're kind of reduced to an, like an overlapping sheath from the base of the plant, and, and they're very, very smooth. So they don't really have leaves like, um, um, like we think of other, other orchids, with some have the big um, elliptical leaf. So they have about four to 19 flowers and they're on very short stalks. And they're not very showy on this species. They're like pale green, yellowish, and sometimes um, they have purple brown along the, the outer tips. And so they bloom between May to June. So hence why they call it the early coral root because it's blooming time is earlier in the season. And you can find these in swamps and bogs and thickets and upland forests. Um, I've actually a couple of times been surprised walking through um, like a mature sugar maple forest um, along the Bruce Trail and there'll be like a little little divot where, where the moisture kind of collects a little bit more and um, shockingly enough I, I've come across these um, this species so sometimes you find them in places that you, you wouldn't even expect to see them so. And so this species is mostly self-pollinating, although it does, it does get a little help from the insects. So the next coral root, so this is spotted coral roots. Um, you'll see as we go along why they kind of, they place the common name the way they do, right? 
Um, they call it spotted coral, coral root because the flowers, there's about six to 50 flowers. Um, the edges and outer surface are a deeper brownish purple and the lower lip is white with, you guessed it, has purple spotting. So that's why they call it the spotted coral root. So once again, it has very reduced leaves, um, very similar, similar to early coral root. Um, they, they have the overlapping sheaths on the lower stem. They're very smooth. And sometimes the, these leaves kind of range in color from pale to deeper brownish yellow. So you can see in the, the top picture there, um, sometimes they, they grow in bunches. So you, sometimes you'll find just one, just one isolated plant. And then sometimes you'll, you'll find a whole clump of them. Um, I believe this, the picture on the top was taken farther north up on the peninsula. And yeah, I just stumbled upon this huge, there's probably about 50, 50 to 70 stems of, of the spotted coral root. So it's a you know, pretty exciting find when you find that many of them. Um, so the habitat, they kind of like moist upland forests and swamps. Um, I find that this species I find more in, in, in forests than I do in, in wetlands. Um, and this plant obtains its nutrients from decaying organic matter through a parasitic relationship with the, the fungi in the soil. Um, so uh, there are quite a few plants in Ontario that gather their nutrients like that. And uh, the coral roots are one of, one of those species. So the next one is striped coral root. Once again, um, why do you think they call it striped coral root? Well, it's because the flowers, they're the creamy white and they have purple to red stripes, as you can see in the pictures. Once again, this, um, they have very reduced leaves, pale green that are overlapping, um, very similar to all the other coral roots. Um, they usually have seven to 26 flowers. They bloom between May to July. So th th this, this species has quite a long blooming period. And um, this is probably, probably the most abundant coral root that you can find on the peninsula. Pretty much every property that we go to that has a nice deciduous or coniferous or mixed forest, um, when we're doing our field work up on the peninsula, we all, almost always find um, striped coral roots uh, growing. And so I'm not gonna guarantee it, but if you go for a hike between you know, May to July, you'll probably see um, some striped coral roots. But don't hold me to that, you never know. So the fun fact for this one is the jointed coral shaped roots is what gives this group of orchids their name. So we can't really see the, the roots and uh, please do not pull these orchids out to look at the roots, just leave them as they be, but take my word from it. For it. It's, it's the roots that give these, these uh, orchids their name. Okay, so we're out of the coral roots and we're into another tway blade species. So this is low cells tway blade. Once again, as with most of the, our tway blade species, this has two basal leaves that are the kind of oblong elliptic shaped and they're gently pointed. So you can see in the, um, the far right picture, there's the, the picture of the whole plant. So they, uh, they bloom from June to July and they like wet meadows, fens, and swamps, and are often found along shores. Um, another common name for this species is they call it bog tway blade, just because it likes, um, it likes wetlands. Um, as a matter of fact, I was act actually just doing field work down in the, um, just north of Toronto on one of uh, our properties, our new properties, and I found probably about 100 stems of this, this species growing along um, kind of like this, the stream, the, the, the banks of a stream. And the, the property is actually, it's an old quarry. Um, so it's, it's amazing to see just how nature can kind of reclaim itself. Uh, I, I never expected to find this species growing there, um, that plentiful as well. So, And so here's one of those species that is it's very easily overlooked because the small yellowish green plants, the, the very 
inconspicuous among, you know, the other accompanying vegetation. So now we got the long bracted green orchis. So they have two to six elliptical to have long leaves with a blunt point, and they kind of sheath the stem at the base. And as they go rise up the, the stem, they become smaller and more lance shaped up the stem. So as you can see from the pictures, it's almost like they're, you know, they're just all these leaves as sticking out from the stem. So um, it's a very recognizable orchid, but once again, um, it's all green. Every part of this, this orchid is green from the stem, the leaves, to the flowers. Um, so the fun fact is actually another common name for this orchid is they call it the frog orchid. Because I guess we assume all frogs are green, which is not correct. But. So they have 11 to 76 irregular flowers and they're, they're always at the top of the stem. And sometimes they, they have a little tinge of purple. Um, but that's, I've never seen that myself. And they bloom from May to, to August. And they like moist woods and thickets, meadows and bogs. Um, anytime I've ever, I've ever seen the long bracted green orchid, it's in a, a nice mature forest. Gener generally that's undisturbed. So now we're gonna get, get into some of the lady slippers. I think when people think of orchids, Lady slippers are always kind of what comes comes to uh, to their mind. So this is the pink lady slipper. Um, once again, the people who name these plants are you know right on. Eh? The pink lady slipper. It uh, looks like a slipper and it's pink. So this this species actually has two really large basal leaves and um, they can, they have many conspicuous parallel veins uh, along the leaves. So even when this species isn't in bloom. Sometimes you can identify it just by the leaves alone. And you know, the flower is a single, just a large pink flower <clears throat> that kind of sits atop this long slender stem. And they bloom from May to July. So um, right now they're kind of at the end of their blooming, blooming period. So they like wet forests, swamps, bogs. Um, I see a lot of these in Coniferous forest because they like the acidic soil um, from the, that is provided by our coniferous trees. And so, like most orchids, this species faces several threats, including poaching for horticultural and medicinal purposes, habitat loss, disturbance from urbanization and development, and competition from invasive species, and lastly, um, climate change. So like, like most of our orchids, probably like all of our orchids and most of our native species in Ontario, um, a lot of them are, are, are under threat by um, all different kinds of, of things. So it's, it's important that, you know, we protect the habitat for these species. So they'll, they'll be here for generations and generations. So now we got the Northern Green Orchid. So this, once again, very, very slender plant has very few to several leaves that go up, kind of go up along the single stem. And they're, they're very thin, oblong to, mostly are lance linear shaped. It has five to 40 small irregular flowers that's on a nice slender yellowish green stalk. And they, they bloom from June to August. And they like bogs and swamps and fens. Oftentimes, I find them along streams, even in ditch banks. You, you know, you, you go for a walk on a highway, you, you look down in a ditch, and sometimes you'll see um, these orchids and several other species of orchids. Like, uh, you know, if it's a wet ditch, if they get a chance, they'll grow there. Um, you can also find these in meadows and thickets and seeps and forests, a lot of times along the Niagara Escarpment. Um, when I talked about seeps earlier, I, I see a lot of these orchids kind of growing in, in the seeps. They, they really like that uh, unique habitat. <clears throat> and so a fun fact is this species is also self-pollinated. So next we got the rose pagonia. 
Uh, once again, a really, really just an awesome orchid that you find this orchid, um, which isn't too hard. Once again, if you go to the, the west side of the peninsula, you see a lot of these rose pagonias growing in the fens and uh, once again, even the ditch banks along the roads. So it has a little single leaf. It's typically about halfway up the stem. Um, it's elliptical in shape and it has a little pointed tip. And sometimes there is a second long stalk, long stalk leaf at the base of the plant. Um, so the flowers are very, very showy and, and very bright pink and they sit atop of the slender stem. So once again, this is a very easy orchid to identify. Once, once you learn what it looks like, you'll, you'll, you'll never, never forget how to identify it. So it blooms in, from June to July and it likes coniferous bogs and swamps, peatlands, wet meadows, and sometimes it's even found in, in some open woods. And so some say that this flower looks as, as if, oh, my light went off. Some say this flower kind of looks like it has a toothy grin, or it looks like a snake's mouth. So the other common name for this uh, species is the snake's mouth orchid. <laughs> I'm doing this presentation in our Bruce Trail office, and I'm in a room where the, the light is on a motion sensor and sometimes it doesn't come back on. So I will finish it in the dark. So our next species is the showy lady slipper. <clears throat> I think this is one of the species that a lot of people aim to see. They, you know, they really want to see this plant and for good reason. Um, they don't call it showy lady slipper for nothing. It, this, this is a large, this is the largest orchid. I think we have up there and um, it's just it's spectacular when you see these a group of these orchids in bloom once again they're unmistakable um, their flowers one or two on each plant <clears throat> just so large and showy and just just absolutely gorgeous when you see these um, and as you see they're white and they're heavily streaked with uh, with pink so they're pretty much right now at the end of their blooming period as well. So if you haven't seen these this year, you might, you're gonna have to wait till next year. So they bloom from June to, to July. And they like swamps and sedge meadows and calcareous fens and moist woods. <coughs> so you can kind of see a trend when you're talking about orchids. Um, a lot of them like wetlands. So if you wanna see wetlands, or if you want to see orchids, uh, you know, you head to a wetland that has some trails through it, some boardwalk, and uh, you'll have success in, in finding some of these species. So in Canada, this species is actually critically imperiled in Saskatchewan, imperiled in New Brunswick, in Prince Edward Island, and the Foundlands, and it is vulnerable in Manitoba and Quebec. So it's only in Ontario that this species is considered apparently secure. <clears throat> so um, I think mean, that that's just a, a cool fact that here in Ontario, you know, we, we have an abundance of, of showy lady slippers, but in, in other areas of Canada, they, you know, they're not doing so well. <clears throat> so the showy orcas. So this this species tends to be my nemesis. For some reason, I can hardly ever find it in flower. Um, these two pictures was, I just got lucky one day and um, just happened to stop, I think to tie my, my, uh, my boot up and there it was staring me in the face. So um, I do find they're, they're actually, they're hard to see when you're, when you're hiking through the bush. And even though the flowers, you know, has a nice, there's two to 10 flowers on it. And it has um, kind of like an arching purple to pink hood. Um, the white lip is kind of hidden. I see it when you're, you know, as you're looking down, you don't generally see that, that white. Um, and yeah, I just, I always find it just difficult to, to see these flowers. And I've walked by them several times without even noticing. And then someone behind me will, will point it out. So, <clears throat> so they like to, to bloom in May to June. 
and they just love rich, mature forests. So maybe that's why it's so hard to, to see them is because there's, uh, you know, the forest floor, um, all the other vegetations growing up around them because they're not very big orchids. They're, um, you know, they're kind of small. They have, they have big leaves. They have two large oval basal leaves, but the, the flower stalk itself is, is quite, quite short. And so these are actually primarily pollinated by bumblebees. <clears throat> so now we got the lesser purple fringed orchid. This is another one of my favorites just because you can probably tell by now, I really like the showy <laughs> bright orchids, um, which is exactly what this one is. You can see by the picture, it's got um, just a dense, pack of purple, pink, white flowers. They have the, the uh, fringed lip, the top is the stem, which is why they, why they call it a fringed orchid. Blooms from July to August. Um, leaves are oval to elliptical with pointed tips and they become progressively smaller as they ascend the stem. So when this orchid is not in flower, once again, it's easy to overlook, but when it's in flower, you, you can't help but, but see it. Um, that, that head of flowers is, gets quite large sometimes and, and elongated. <clears throat> so it likes to have moist woods, swamps, marshes, wet meadows, and shorelines. So once again, uh, an orchid that loves wetlands. So the scientific name, the psychoides, it comes from the Greek word meaning butterfly-like, referring to the shape of the flowers. Some people say the flowers look like little, little butterflies. So that's up to your interpretation. So now we got perhaps the most identifiable orchid, I think, on the peninsula. I think everyone knows the uh, yellow, large yellow lady slipper. <clears throat> when you drive up, it blooms from June to August. So when you take a drive up on the, the peninsula at this time, these, these orchids line the roadside. Um, pretty much anywhere you hike on the Bruce Trail, you'll see, see these orchids. Um, they bloom in people's yards, I've seen them, <laughs> so they're, they're not rare, let's put it that way, they're very, very common. So they have three or more leaves that are alternate along the stem, and they're oval to ovate, and they also have parallel veins, much like the, uh, the pink lady slipper. Um, the flowers, once again, are pretty well known, large, that slipper, um, with the twisted lateral petals, greenish yellow to brownish purple. So um, you see in the pictures, they got those lateral petals that kind of stick out from the sides and in the top. And habitat, yeah, pretty much almost everywhere. Um, I don't think there's a place, I don't think there's a habitat, I have not seen this species, um, but yeah, it's uh, just very common and uh, it's a very hardy, hardy orchid. <clears throat> So the fun fact for this one is that there is a subspecies and it's called the small yellow lady slipper. And so it's very, very similar, except that the flowers are smaller in size, obviously, because of the name. And the lateral petals seem to be more, more of a dark maroon. And then the flowers sometimes are more likely to have like a, a vanilla smell. So, you, you know, you got to get down and uh, just take a whiff. If you see like a smaller, um, yellow lady slipper that you think you might need the, uh, the subspecies. So if, if you get that hint of vanilla, then you, you might have found the, um, the small yellow lady slipper. So yeah, so on the, on the peninsula, there, there, there's several species of rattlesnake plantains. And so I chose this one because it's, it's the most common. Um, once again, if you're hiking along the Bruce Trail or, um, or any other trails up there and you, you're in a coniferous or a mixed forest, almost guaranteed you're going to see the, uh, the Menzies rattlesnake plantain. <clears throat> it's also one of the easiest ones to identify because it has the, you know, three to seven leaves that form a basal rosette, which means the leaves are only along, around the base of the plant, so they don't grow along the stem. Um, and it has that, they're green and they have that white line down the middle. So you can see in the, the bottom picture there. 
Some of the other species of rattlesnake plantains, they have a more elaborate pattern on their leaves. And then sometimes it gets a little bit more confusing um, to decipher um, those species from one another. But this species, when you see it, you know, it's, um, you can't mistake it. So they bloom from July to September. So they're more of a later blooming species as are most of our um, rattlesnake plantains. Um, I've actually seen them in, if you get a warmer fall, I've seen them in November, um, you know, still somewhat in bloom. So that's, that's pretty late for, uh, for any species to, to bloom. But. And so the fun fact is that the common name actually comes from the snake-like venation pattern that this genus has on its leaves. So once again, that's up to interpretation. Um, if you think the leaves look like they have a snake-like pattern, then that's where the name comes from. <clears throat> so I had to throw this species in. So this is one of our non-native orchids. So obviously all the species I just talked about are native to Ontario. Um, Helleborine. Is, uh, is not native. We don't have a lot of non-native orchid species, but this one is probably the most common and the most well-known. I think everyone's probably seen this species. Because um, once again, it's, it's kind of like the yellow lady slipper. This thing grows everywhere. I've seen it growing in, on a concrete sidewalk in between the little the little line between the concrete, I've seen a helleborine growing in there. So once again, very, very hardy, uh, very tough, tough plant. Um, some would say maybe somewhat invasive uh, if you get them in certain areas. Um, so they're, to identify them, they're, they're, they're large, they're a large plant. And then the leaves are also large. They're elliptical and they're all along the stem and they, they tend to clasp the stem. So it's, it's a very, very leafy orchid, <clears throat> as you can see from the pictures. Um, the flowers are actually quite beautiful. Like, I, uh, there's a nice close-up there of the, the Helleborine flower. So they're like whitish green and they have some purple and some pink, pink with them. And they bloom from July to September. Uh, so once again, because they're, they're a hardy species, they tend to have a, a long blooming period. So the habitat, I should have just put everywhere, but uh, yeah, you know, forests, ditches, lawns, disturbed areas. <coughs> and the fun fact was that they're not native to Ontario. So yeah, so we went through a, a whole, whole bunch of species of orchids. And like I said, I tried to pick some of the more common species that you're more likely to, to see when you, you know, when you just go for a hike, hike uh, along the Bruce Trail. Um, but there's, there's so many, many more species, um, you know, not only on the peninsula, but also all along the Bruce Trail. And uh, so here's just a few. I won't name them, I'll just I'll let you, uh, this will be your homework. You can see if you can identify these species from, uh, from the pictures. Um, although I, I will point out there's a, the one species in the bottom in the middle. I love that species because the, the flowers look like little, little elves or, or little dwarves. So I, I think that's, it's a really cute orchid um, if you can find it. And once again, most of these uh, species they love undisturbed, either mature forests or, um, you know, nice undisturbed wetlands. Um, that's why we have to protect the, the habitat that these species thrive in, because um, if we don't have the habitat, we're not going to have the species. So um, very important. And many of these, many of our orchid species are considered rare in Ontario. Um, so it just you know makes makes the effort that much more valuable to protect them. So I have to say the uh, the Peninsula Bruce Trail Club. So they actually have an orchid badge. So if you don't know anything about the Bruce Trail and its clubs, 
our members and our hikers, they love their badges, um, just love them. So, um, you know, many, we have nine different clubs. Each club generally has a, a badge for uh, to do an end to end <clears throat> or for other, um, other reasons. So the, the Peninsula Bruce Trail Club created this orchid badge. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a really fun, fun way to get out, you know, get out on the Bruce Trail, get out on other trails, other protected areas that, that have access. And so you want to document through the photo, so you have to take a photo, um, the name of the orchid, the location, and you have to do this for a minimum of 15 species of wild orchids on the Saugeen Peninsula. So it's a, it's a bit of a challenge. Um, like I said, some, some of the orchids are very common. You, you'll see them all over. You know, some, some you gotta look a little bit harder for and uh, take your time. Um, you know, when you're going for a hike and you're wandering around, just slow down and just take, take in what you're looking at. And, and as long as you look, um, you'll have no problem finding the 15 species of, of orchids. So all the, all the, the orchids that must be recorded in one calendar year, and they must be found along the sides of the main Bruce Trail or one of our many side trails. That uh, so from Wyerton to Tobermory, so that's the peninsula section um, of the Bruce Trail. So you want to record your observations in a log, and then in the log you want to acknowledge your awareness of good orchid etiquette. So that was basically the the second or third slide. Um, that I was talking about when you're looking at orchids. So once you've fulfilled the requirements for this, um, you can go to the Peninsula Bruce Trail Club website. And so there it is at the bottom. And there'll, there'll be instructions for how you can obtain, obtain this badge. <coughs> so like I said, it's, you know, it's a little bit of fun. Um, get you outdoors, really get you looking at uh, you know, at our species of orchids and, um, you know, you're breathing the fresh air and you're, you're having a good time. So if you're interested, I think it's a, a fun idea. So I don't know how I'm doing on time, but now we've got questions. So if anybody has any, any questions from the presentation. Okay, so I will ask the questions for the people in chat. We'll start with the simple one here, but a good one to be addressed. What defines a plant as an orchid? That's a good question. I never even thought about that question. <laughs> um, I, I think with, with every plant species, they have certain characteristics that um, you know kind of put them in that in a certain genus or a certain family. So with orchids, it's all about the, the kind of the, the function. And the form of the flowers and how the flowers work. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Um, another question here is: Does the Bruce Trail Conservancy actively participate in any conservation or protection of orchids? Yeah, as um, like I said, we're we're a land trust, and um, so we have a land stewardship department, which I'm part of. Um, so whenever we acquire land, the, the first thing we do is we do a three season ecological inventory. Um, we we, we wanna see all the plants, to identify all the plants that are on the property along with other things, birds and amphibians and whatnot. Um, so any areas that we do find orchids, um, especially if they're rare orchids, then we make sure that the, the trail doesn't go anywhere near the, where, that, where the rare orchid species is. And, um, you know, we just, we actively protect acres and acres of land. And anytime you protect land, um, you know, you're protecting habitat for all these species, so not only orchids, but, you know, every species out there that, that needs protection. Yeah, cool. So if anyone else has any other questions, we still have time and those are the only ones we have so far. So feel free. Oh, I think maybe a new one came up. Was I too fast? No, 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 we're good. <laughs> Could you recommend any source documents? Uh, like field guides and stuff? Is that what? I think that's what we're referring yeah. to, yeah. Actually, 
That's a good question because I forgot to. This is probably one of my favorite guides. I don't know if you can see that. So it's basically it's so the it's the orchids of Bruce and Gray County. And it's put out by the Owen Sound Field Naturalists. This is probably one of the best field guides for orchids in that area, and you know I use it all the time. Um, you know there are other more general field guides. There's the, the Petersons field guides for um, plants of like northeastern North America. Um, so that there are several guides out there, but I don't think nothing can beat the, the Owen Sound Field Naturalist uh, Orchid Guide. It's a, it's got it's got pictures, it's got full descriptions, it's got habitat, and um, it's it's just great for that area because it's specific to that area. So. Um, oh yeah, and then follow up question: Where do you get the guide? <laughs> We, you contact the own sound field naturalist. <laughs> so they, they have a website. <laughs> so that's, uh, you just, you know, go on the web and, and Google own sound field naturalist. And I think they have a, um, a page where you can order their books. They, they have several other books. They have one on specifically on ferns of the peninsula and they have one on golden rods and asters of the peninsula. So they're just great, great field guides specific to those kind of hard families of plants, so to identify. Okay, I think that's still all of the questions we have so far. <laughs> We've still got a few minutes if anyone else has anything else you want to ask. I should say too um, that iNaturalist app, I mentioned that earlier in the presentation, it is also a really good resource um, just to even, you know, just kind of search um, species of orchids and you can kind of see, even though I do, well, you know, I hope a lot of people are obscuring where they are, but you can get a general area of, um, you know, where you can spot some of these species. Yeah, and we'll have a, another talk on that, I think, on Saturday, more about iNaturalist itself. So oh, well, there you go. more opportunity to talk about it. <laughs> okay, so um, has this been a good year for the orchids, like favorable weather for them? I think it has been. Um, like I said, we, I do field work all the way from Niagara Falls to, to, to Overmoring, and uh, I, I've, I've seen a lot of orchids, and I've seen a lot... Like normally when you when I see orchids, I see it one or two. This year I've seen areas where there's, like I said, the, the Lausol's Tway Blade, right? there's 50, 50 or 70 of them. Um, there's a, that Northern Green Orchid that was in the presentation on another property. And once again, there was probably a hundred stems and just in a nice wetland area. And I've never seen that many of one, that species growing in one area, like all together. So um, I, have, I think if that's any indication, I think it's a pretty good year for, for orchids. It's good to hear. <laughs> uh, do you run any hikes to see the, or the orchids? Yeah, we, I personally don't do any specific orchid hikes, but uh, sometimes some of the Bruce Trail Clubs do run, um, whether it's a, you know, a wildflower hike or um, like a specific orchid hike. Um, so a lot of times, like I said, there's nine different Bruce Trail clubs, so they're sometimes they're doing different things. So uh, the best bet is maybe contact the, the, you know, if you're in the Bruce, the Soggy and Bruce Peninsula, if you're up in that area, contact the Bruce Trail Club um, and just see if, if they do um, organize any hikes like that. Mm -hmm. And. Uh... Relating to orchids in other provinces, for the ones that are listed as endangered or rare, are they because are they listed as that because they're declining in numbers, or just because there is so few of them already? Um, probably for each each species in each different area, it's, it's just probably different aspects or different 
um, things that are affecting those orchids. So I like thought that's a hard question to, to answer. Um, like I know in Ontario, there are certain species are either at their southern limit to their range or their northern limit to their range, so that they were never that um, ne never that common. Um, other species were common, but because of habitat loss and um, um, I think acid rain had a lot to do up in the northern areas, um, you know, cause those common species to decline. So it's, it's hard, it's hard to say what's causing the decline in, in other provinces because I'm not, uh, um, I don't have any experience in those provinces. So. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, um, what is uh, the best time of year to visit and try to see orchids? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, because like I said, a lot of some are early blooming, some are late blooming. So, so it uh, depends on the type you want to see. Yeah, but I, to be honest, I think the end of June and all of July, like that's that's when you're going to see the rose begonia. That's when you're going to see the showy lady slipper. Um, a lot of the, the a lot of the green orchids I talked about uh, kind of bloom in that period. So I think end of June and all of July is kind of that probably the best time of year I think to see orchids um, on the Saugeen Peninsula so mm. but you know what we're almost done July so we're, we're too late <laughs> <laughs> see I think this question is asking about the badge that you guys have it says um, can 15 species of orchids be found growing on one trip or do you think You'll need multiple trips. Uh, you probably need multiple trips. Although if you went up in late June or July, you might get them all. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to get a really lucky hike. Yeah, yeah. See, are there um, any references specific for trails that you could find orchids on instead of just a general like field guide? Yeah, for, I would say for orchids, there's the, it's called the Oliphant Fen. It's on the, the west side of, um, of Lake Huron. And it's a, you know, it's a protected area and it has a beautiful boardwalk through it. So um, you can see a lot of orchid species in that area. And there's also Petrel Point, which is kind of north of Oliphant. And it's a really nice spot to um, to view orchids. Um, you get, like I said, you get, you get a lot of the, the showier orchids in there because it's a fen. So um, fens, are, it's, a, it's a specific type of wetland that they, but it, orchids really love that habitat. So, hmm. um, how are the the orchids doing on the Saugeen Peninsula? Like, are there any threatened by climate change that you know of? Yeah, I think it's. Because we're kind of climate change has been around for a while, but how it's affecting kind of certain species is it's a little tougher to determine. Um, I think eventually, yeah, most of our plant species and possibly animal species are going to be somewhat affected. Whether it's a it's a just a gradual change or, or are they a drastic effect that's going to wipe them out I, I don't think so but i think it's you know it's going to it's going to make make it harder for them to thrive so we might see declining numbers in, in certain species um, but yeah I, I just i don't think the science is really really um, out there yet to, to really know for sure what kind of effect that's going to have although the, like i said there are, there are quite a few species um, up on the peninsula that, you know, they're not common or they are rare. Um, and that's, that's also because of some of them, there's certain habitat they, that, that they, they desire. And kind of with settlement and um, development, some of that habitat's been taken away. So that's why, like I said, it's important for, um, you know, land trusts and, and Ontario parks and federal park to protect uh, or spaces for, for these species. Hey, and uh, 
we're at 7.55, so I guess that's all the time we have so far for this one. So thanks again, uh, Ryan, for the talk and then spending the time to answer all these questions from everyone. And sorry if I didn't get to anyone's question in the chat. That's okay, yeah, that's great. Thanks for, thanks for having me. And everyone enjoy the next uh, presentation. Yeah, thanks. So we're gonna take a five minute break and we'll be back at about eight o'clock for the next talk. <laughs>